My name is George Thurston. I'm a professor uh, of environmental medicine at the New York University School of Medicine. Um, and you know, here at COP26, there is a lot of excitement about new ambitions that people are announcing. And um, so there's excitement, but there's also concern. And the concern is the how, right? I think people agree that how are we gonna do these and make these ambitions happen? And that's what this session is about. You know, it, it's been said that while the climate crisis is the greatest environmental threat of the 21st century, that climate action to deal with it is the greatest public health opportunity of the 21st century. If we do it right, we can get lots of health benefits. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about here, how cities where uh, I've heard like 40% of the climate emissions are from the built environment, for example, and that's mostly in the city, right? So cities have a big role to play. And so um, today, Dr. John Wright will be um, the moderator of this discussion of how do we move forward? How do we make ambition into reality? John? Thank you, George. So um, we're hurtling towards the cliff edge of the agreement for COP26 and everybody's nervous but excited. And as always with conferences, uh, the organizers have saved the best till the end. And this panel, we've got a great selection of uh, panelists and speakers for you. Uh, so tempting that I gather Barack Obama flew in just a couple of days ago to join us. Uh, my name is John Wright. I'm an epidemiologist and a doctor. And uh, my, my research over the last 20 years has really converted me to the view that our cities are more important for our health than our hospitals. And what is good for human health is good for planetary health. And I'm joined by some leading experts in the field uh, who are going to share their wisdom and expertise. Um, we're going to have conversations. Uh, we've got an opportunity to do some Q and A. So if you want to add uh, some Q and A's, and do, do just click and tell, ask who you want to ask a question to. The session is being recorded, and um, uh, you everything's muted. I think is that right? Oh yes, for technical reasons, microphones are deactivated and the chat is deactivated. So raised hands will not be attended. So Q and A's, please, if you want to ask a question, and if we have time, we'll come to those at the end. But I'm going to move swiftly on to our first panelist, uh, the famous Mark Newenhausen, world famous epidemiologist um, and professor at uh, the uh, the IS Global Global Health Institute in Barcelona. Uh, good evening, Mark. Hello, good evening, John. How are you doing? So tell me, Mark, this is all about cities. So, so before we move on to the health consequences of cities, why, why are we focusing on cities rather than, say, towns and villages? I, I, I think, I mean, towns and villages are to some extent also important, but most of the people nowadays actually live in cities uh, and they're actually growing. Cities are a big attraction for people to be there because of jobs and uh, cultural events, etc. cetera. Um, and that's why we're talking about cities because they can take a very important role uh, in climate action. Okay, so, so let, let's start with health then. So this is your field. Why, why do cities harm our, harm our health? Well, first of all, I mean, cities are also pretty good. Eh? That uh, it's, uh, people love to live in cities. We have access to healthcare, we have jobs, I mean, very important. But there are some aspects that are not as good. I mean, uh, first of all, cities are uh, characterized by its density. Uh, people are much closer together. I mean, uh, cities, I think, in general, um, take up about three, four percent of the of the planet uh, space. Um, they're very dense. People on top of each other, and that also, uh, because we need to get around, generates a lot of mobility. And unfortunately, a lot of the mobility is motorized uh, private traffic. Uh, and that's what we see in many cities happen. And even if it's often not the, the, the primary mode of transport, um, cars seem to be dominating uh, our cities. This partly uh, results in, in much higher air pollution levels in cities. Um, we know that cities are hotspots of air pollution. Uh, 
Um, air pollution causes around 400,000 deaths in Europe. Uh, we recently did a study and we saw that uh, 200,000 deaths each year in, in, in a, around uh, 1,000 major cities in Europe are caused by air pollution. Now, the air pollution doesn't only come from cars, but of course, there are other sources like heating and uh, some industry, some ports, etc. Um, but the motorized traffic plays an important role. That's also uh, responsible for noise. We see that uh, there are many cities that are pretty noisy. And this is also related to some health effects, including, uh, for example, cardiovascular disease and mortality. The other thing is what we're seeing is that uh, many cities are um, suffering of heat island effects, particularly in the south. I mean, in a city like Barcelona, where I live, uh, the city center is about four or five degrees uh, hotter than surrounding areas because of the, the great amount of concrete and a particular also asphalt that is in the city. Okay, so uh, Mark, Mark, so we, we've got this sort of air pollution, noise and heat are the exposures that are bad for our health. What, what consequences of, on health are they? How, how do they harm us? So as what I said, you know, we see that uh, in, increased uh, premature mortality in the cities, uh, particularly due to the air pollution levels, to the noise levels, to the heat island effects, the extreme heat, but also lack of green space and a lack of physical activity, what we see sometimes. But it's, of course, not only um, premature mortality, but it also affects, you know, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease. We see also effects on the brain in particular, in particular from uh, what we see from air pollution nowadays, that it's got detrimental effects on the brain function, both for children and for the elderly. On the other side, green space is good for the brain. Um, and But then also we see, for example, childhood asthma. Many kids get asthma, and we think that about a third of the asthma, childhood asthma, is actually caused by traffic-related air pollution. Okay, so, so how do we create healthier cities then? What's the solution? I mean, there are many different policies that you could implement of what you should be doing. And uh, first of all, it's, it's a matter of raising awareness that people are aware that the current urban and transport planning practices have an adverse impact on, on health. Uh, secondly, I think what we're seeing in many cities is they try to reduce private car use uh, and move to much more active and public transportation, what results in lower air pollution uh, levels, for example, and less noise. Um, we see also new micromobility occurring, like electric patinettes, for example, that may or may not be uh, healthier in a way. Uh, they're also uh, associated with many accidents. Um, we see also cleaner car use, like electric cars uh, being introduced. I think, uh, I, myself, I'm not very much in favor of electric cars in cities. I mean, I think outside cities is okay, but inside cities, we should be more focusing on active and public transportation. Other measures, what we see is in, in, in introducing more cycling lanes to get people to cycle more, um, introducing low emission zones, uh, to, to reduce the air pollution emissions within the city, and, and of course, increasing um, green space. What I particularly like is, for example, the, the new kind of uh, rule of thumb is the 330, 300 rule for green space, and that we should be having green space that people should be uh, seeing at least three trees from the window. They should live in a neighborhood with 30% green space and have a major uh, green space within 300 meters of their home. Three, sorry, um, let's go through that again, Mark. Three trees from your window. And three trees from your window, 30% yeah. of the land cover in your neighborhood should be uh, green space. Yeah. And you should have a major green space of at least 0.5 hectares within 300 meters of your house. Wow, I wonder how many places have that. Right, Mark, we're going to move on because you've run out of time, I'm afraid. Um, oh, but we'll come back to you at the end, if that's OK. Um, so yeah. I'm going to move on to Christian. Have we got Christian on the screen? Hello, hello. Christian Brand. Uh, good evening, Christian. And uh, Christian's um, uh, an associate professor from Transworld Studies Unit, University of, of Oxford. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how transport in particular uh, affects our carbon emissions. So, so Christian, tell us a little bit about how much transport contributes to CO2 emissions. Hello, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, so 
in cities, uh, I think more than 70% um, of global final energy use uh, is, is in cities. And, and of that share, that's quite a big share, and that's likely to increase, particularly in sort of developing nations. So, sorry, so um, 70%, is that, so that's direct and indirect? Cities, yeah, yeah. Uh, global final energy use. So it's a little bit less if you also include um, agriculture and other, other, other stuff, but this mm. is sort of final energy use. And that includes um, all the concrete and the and the coal burning power stations. It, uh, it 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 depends. It depends a little bit. Sometimes it includes um, aviation. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. The the estimates are between sixty and eighty percent, and okay. it's not not that, not that not that straightforward. There's different scopes of emissions. So I just got one, two, and three. I don't want to go into detail there, but it's. Uh, I think the um, the most uh, robust figure I've seen is about seventy percent. And if you then look at just transport within this, uh, it's about a third of that is uh, for transport um, within cities. It's higher elsewhere. It's about 66% uh, higher in, in rural areas. So cities are actually quite good in a sense um, that you know, private car journeys are already lower than in, in rural areas and in suburban areas. Uh, it's still a big problem, though, um, although some people say that private car journeys uh, why they present, represent about half of all trips made in, in, made in major cities that might go down by 2030 30, um, due to you know, things happening within uh, demographics, uh, younger people not um, taking up the car as much as, uh, as we used to and so on. But maybe we come back to that a little bit, um, uh, a little bit later. And how, how much is from car use and how much is from other transport sources then, Christian? Yeah, so we usually take an approach of sort of uh, on a life cycle basis, especially with electric vehicles. Now you have to look at the whole life cycle of the vehicle. Um, and there, if you compare, for example, cycling, uh, acoustic cycling, you know, just a normal push bike, um, e-biking, um, electric car and a normal fossil fuel or internal combustion engine car, then cycling is about 30 times lower for each trip than driving a fossil fuel car and about 10 times lower than driving an electric one. And if you have this sort of ratio from bike, e-bike, electric car, and uh, fossil fuel car, it's about one to three to 10 to 30. So one to three to 10 to 30 is quite, quite nice to remember. So in a sense, biking and e-biking are a lot uh, less carbon per mile travel. So this is just for one kilometer travel. But if you look also at um, on a daily basis, you know, what do people do on a daily basis? It's we're, we're pretty much, or most of us are pretty multimodal. You know, we use different modes of transport over the course of a day. And in one of the major studies um, here in European cities, we found that if you are um, a biker in a sense, so you do use your bike uh, at least once a day, you have a much lower carbon footprint of all travel over a course of a day. And that's true whether you look at that uh, cross-sectionally, you know, at the population at one time in a uh, point in time or uh, longitudinal if people do change from one to the other. So, so, um, so what stops urban transport planning in, in its efforts to reduce car use? So the, <laughs> well, um, the whole thing's not rocket science. I mean, as we all know, I think as Mark also, also pointed out, we know how to do this. We, we do have to go further and faster in sort of redesigning our cities and to start really with the reducing the need to travel and move goods, then shift to lowest, the lowest possible carbon and healthy mode of travel. Uh, that's uh, walking, cycling, and public transport, in particular electric public transport. And then, yes, if you do have to travel by car, in a city, make it an electric vehicle, but not the other way around. So a COP, of course, we're here in the blue zone, especially. It's it's all about uh, electric vehicles. And the uh, the main exhibit was a Formula One uh, racing car, electric. You know, that's, so big, that's not it's, that's it's not really big, what we need in cities, right? So No, it's a bit of a distraction. Everybody's attention is on electric vehicles, isn't it? Are they, is, yeah. are, is there our attention being displaced? Uh, no, we, we need we need electric vehicles, but I think attention, it, it, there's a bit of a danger. And if we've been sort of arguing, if you just focus on this one thing, you don't invest in, in all the other options that are actually much more important in cities. And there's a danger. So that's why I've been arguing that actually this focus on electric vehicles sort of uh, delays, inhibits our, our, our progress, really. Um, while, of course, if you're a techno optimist, then um, electric vehicles is the panacea. And uh, that, 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 that's not, not, not the case. And 
everybody's saying this from the International Energy Agency down to national governments, um, it's almost virtually impossible or very, very expensive to get to near zero carbon uh, over the next 30 years, but just focus on electric vehicles. And the main reason is because this transformation takes just so so long. So you have to sort of, in, in a sense, a curve that starts slowly to go down, but what we really need to do is uh, like a ski slope that's very, very steep, like a, a black route rather than a blue route that's uh, gently going down. And, and that steep slope, what, what what's involved in that steep slope then, Christian? You really have to do curbing traffic, uh, shift loads, share vehicles, and downsize and electrify the vehicle fleet, it, it, almost in that in that order. And well, uh, we've done a study here in the UK on this, and what we found is you can do a lot in terms of avoiding the need to travel, but to do this consistently, you have to sort of think, oh, here, yeah, if you, if you, for example, fly less uh, internationally, we might spend more holidays within the country, which increases other emissions, right? So there's a, yeah, if, if you look at sort of the futures that we, we're looking at, so you have to be um, holistic and, and consistent. But if you, just through mode shift and uh, avoiding travel, you can reduce energy demand and the emissions associated with that by about half. And the other half comes from uh, electrification. And for some of the more difficult to decarbonize sectors like uh, long distance freight, uh, yes, some sort of green hydrogen, and other techno technological uh, options. Okay, um, Christian, yeah. Christian, thank you very much. Um, so, so it's it's complex. We needed to, to shift our transport modes of travel, and uh, electrification is part of that solution. But yes. there are also unintended consequences. Um, thank you. I'll come back to you also, Christian, at the end. But I'm going to introduce Gara Bayalba, um, who's the who's a who's a chemical engineer, she just told me in the uh, introduction, from the University of Barcelona. Gara, are you there? Yes, hi, good evening, John, and good, good, evening, good evening, everybody. So, so tell us. me a little bit about your, your job, because it sounded quite fascinating, actually, an industrial ecologist and urban agriculturalist. I, I haven't come across many of those reports. So tell, tell, us, tell us what you do as part of that. Um, yeah, sure, that's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> I love to share what I do. Um, the past couple of years, I've really concentrated my work in trying to get the message and the studies that we need to validate the, the need to show everyone um, that we need to integrate nature and make our cities greener for many reasons. And I would really like to highlight three, which is where most of my work um, is involved. One is to gain food sovereignty by promoting urban and peri-urban agriculture. So the loss of priority for urban agriculture in urban land use planning is a global trend. And even here in Barcelona, it's just in the past few decades, we've gone from being able to supply about 20% of the fresh produce that we need to just about two to 3%. And this is due to loss of land for more profitable uses, including transport and some of the other things that we're trying to revert back from. Um, and another reason for this, for gaining, um, for promoting urban and peri-urban agriculture is because it really helps us um, have a more circular use of a lot of the resources that we have in our city. Most importantly, amongst these are nutrients. So we can recover phosphates and not nitrogen from solid waste and wastewater. And so we can have a circular use of these nutrients to promote our own food production in um, urban and peri-urban areas. So that is so, one so of the- Sorry, Gareth. So, yeah, so our sure. food systems are, you know, we're bringing, importing food into cities from far away. Yes. And uh, they have their own uh, life cycles within the, where it's being produced and cities are becoming isolated from that. So, so how, do we, how do we establish, because there, there aren't many places to, to grow stuff in cities. What, how, do we, how do we reverse that? Um, of course, there's, uh, it also depends on the geography, the climate of the city, but uh, we're finding many creative ways uh, to, to increment the, uh, the food production that we have in cities. And there's peri-urban agriculture, there's hydroponics um, in green roofs, um, urban agriculture in green roofs, in, in, in even throughout the city. And uh, a lot of these systems 
are great in that, as I mentioned before, we can use nutrients that are that we can recover from the cities, but also um, we have to be careful that we're not substituting one problem or solving one problem and causing another. So we have to do all of this in and without incrementing the material footprint or the energy footprint in other ways. So for example, we would need more water to do this. So we need to make sure that these food production systems are, um, um, are being irrigated with uh, rainwater harvesting techniques. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we optimize resources in cities and because we're, um, we're avoiding some of the food imports by producing our own, that we're not incrementing our own um, footprint here in the city. And, and um, it, it, most of us think in terms of green space and cities of our parks and, you know, you, in Glasgow COP26, we have a fantastic Victorian heritage of parks that our ancestors built for us because they realised that we needed lungs in our, in our cities. But do, do we still build parks in cities anymore? Or is, that, is, it, is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. Um, uh, most cities have in their urban agendas in, uh, incrementing green, but certainly space is uh, very limited in cities. So um, uh, maybe there isn't that much room for a lot of more green urban parks, uh, but, uh, but there are other ways that we can increment green in, in cities. I mentioned before green roofs in the city of Barcelona, for example, the new urban master plan is um, uh, hoping to implement 720 kilometers of green corridors. And so these are going to be replacing um, uh, lanes of traffic, uh, roads, in many ways, and it's a way to make the city more cohesive and have and promote this active mobility of people. And so these are not parks per se, but they are greening cities and putting trees where um, cars were before. And so I think that we need to be very creative in cities in order to to integrate the nature um, in what in the space that we have left. And I also really want to um, um, put emphasis on the interaction of the city with the peri-urban area, because that really opens up a lot of opportunity for circularity of, um, of resources, especially in terms of uh, local food production. And are we rediscovering old habits of growing our own foods that we used to do years ago? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, even the, the COVID pandemic brought that to light in that we have certainly gone towards um, uh, designing cities that you know, we think we're islands and um, we have everything imported and don't produce much of the things that, that we need, that we metabolize, that we need to grow in our cities. And uh, we, see, uh, um, um, we see a lot of people uh, being very motivated to start producing their own vegetables, to start producing their own food. There's definitely a big wave of this in, in many, many cities. And I think it's very important that we start gaining a little bit of uh, food sovereignty, a little bit of self-sufficiency in some of our basic resources. Okay, Gara, and, and as Mark pointed out, that green, that greenery, that nature is good for our health, it's good for our minds, so there's something, very sort of inbuilt into our evolution that we need that green space. So, so more of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, our next uh, panelist is uh, Audrey de Nazelle, who's a senior lecturer and deputy director of the Center for Environmental Policy in Imperial College. And Gara, we're gonna have to substitute you, I'm afraid, if we can get Audrey I'm up here. on the screen. Hello, good, uh, good to see yeah. you now, good to see everyone. Good. Good, good to see you, Audrey. Um, so um, tell us about the preparedness of cities for the change that we need. We've heard about the health consequences of the need to be more important and more to, to be healthier, the challenges about transport and the carbon emissions, the better, you know, the, this bringing, our back, bringing back nature to cities. Are cities ready for this? So, uh, ready or not, <laughs> they need to make it happen. Uh, I always think of uh, my my uh, babies uh, going and playing hide and seek. They're ready or not, here I come. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I think that it needs to happen. So, we don't have a choice. And I think we need to do everything we can to make it happen. So, some cities are, are uh, starting to implement uh, things. And that's great news. Uh, but I think we all have a role to play. 
to uh, actually go from uh, from lo lo lots of good talks to actually action. And the problem I, I find is that we're st we, as we uh, several of us have already commented on, we tend to focus a bit too much on uh, on very much technological solutions. And that's that's what's slightly worrisome. I think when it comes to cities, of course, uh, for example, electric vehicles have a role to play, but a lot of the discourse around policy making uh, to address climate change um, is and address air pollution is around getting uh, people to uh, get rid of their petrol vehicle and buy instead an electric vehicle. <laughs> oh yeah, too right. So that's, that's the nub of this issue, isn't it? There's about changing individual behaviors is much harder than some new technical technical um, solution that we can do. How, how do we change behaviors? So I think first we need to change the behaviors of our politicians. Uh, that's the, that, I think that's the leading yeah. factor here is, is convincing politicians to take a bold action. And I think that's uh, the first, we can ask, we can try to promote uh, walking, cycling and show all the benefits of, uh, that, on our personal health to, to walk and bike, for example, or take, or take public transportation. But as long as we don't have safe places to, uh, to walk, bike, take public transportation, particularly for cycling, of course, uh, people are just not going to do it because they will feel unsafe. Uh, so we need to get uh, politicians to take that bold action. And I think what's preventing that from happening is... Uh, um, first, lack of leadership and uh, lack of political will. Of course, politicians have multiple um, uh, 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 people to, to, to talk to. There's uh, lots of competing interests that need, they need to respond to. They face a lot of lobbies and they face very short uh, electoral cycles. So they are often hesitant about doing things that will be controversial. And as you said, changing behavior is, is necessarily going to be controversial because it's not always an easy thing to do. So the first thing I think we need to do is, is convince uh, politicians that the best way is not just purely to focus on electric vehicles and, and, and low vehicle fleets. And of course, as, as Christine has said, and as I, I think maybe Mark has also said, it is part of the solution. But when you entirely focus your investments on just that, it means you're, you're, it's an opportunity cost uh, of not investing on something else. And it's also a danger of lock-in into a system that in the long run is not, uh, is not beneficial for us all. So once we've all uh, bought our electric vehicles and we have all the infrastructure, and I saw that today, the big announcement for, from the UK government is all the, the new design of the electric charging, and that was their big announcement for the day. And when I think that my taxpayer money has gone into the design of an electric charge for, uh, electric, uh, for vehicles, when what we need is a, design, a new design of cities. That's what's really needed is getting new designs of cities, new land uses, new, uh, new city planning so that we get people to live in compact cities, that people live close to each other and that there's really safe public transportation, walking and cycling infrastructure. And okay, I think- So, I so think Audrey, can I, can I just ask you, so one of the issues here, which we haven't really touched on, we're, we're quite a European panel, I notice, um, is, is about inequalities globally, but also inequalities within cities. So when you look at cities, those who are most exposed to the um, risk factors that Mark mentioned, the noise and the air pollution and the lack of green space are those living in poorer inner city areas. So tend to be hardest hit. They tend to not be the people buying electric vehicles as well. It's all the middle classes buying electric vehicles. So there's, a, there's a inequalities in terms of impact in our European cities, but also internationally, when you look at cities like Lagos or Karachi or Nairobi, how do they start tackling this issue? Yeah, so, so I think you point exactly to something that's really important in terms of how we create change is I think we really need to create alliances and demonstrate that what is good for uh, uh, climate change, what is good for our health is also good for inequalities, is also good for traffic injuries. And we need to demonstrate uh, to show the evidence that all of these things are linked. And when you uh, choose one policy over another, you, uh, you have repercussions, unintended, consequence, unintended consequences, or, synergy, or synergies and co-benefits versus an, uh, others. So I think when it comes to uh, our role, for example, as researchers, we need to be able to develop that evidence that's a complex evidence that shows how the system works and shows also how people make decisions and how politicians make decisions. I think that's really, of course, I'm speaking from the perspective of a 
of a researcher of what it is that we can contribute. And, uh, but mostly what we can contribute is actually to talk, to collaborate with all stakeholders, all decision makers, from policymakers, from members of the public, uh, from industry, uh, NGOs, so that we together come up with the right evidence that's appropriate for the location where we're at, because you're completely right, the, depending on where you are, the solutions are going to be different. So it's collaborating locally with the ver variety of stakeholders. That's how we understand what are the triggers? What are the leverage points? What are the types of data or how to tell a story that's going to make an impact to not only change politicians and their view of, of how uh, and, and their view of how to tackle climate change and have further co-benefits, particularly for health, and also how to engage citizens so they put more pressure on, on politicians. So I think having this, this um, combined, this collaborative approach, this co-production approach is how we frame it, I think, and when it comes to research. Uh, also combined with systems thinking, so we link, uh, we create the linkages. Uh, I think that's, that's, the, that's the future for uh, bring, creating alliances, cre create, breaking the silos, decision-making in, in cities tend to operate through certain uh, specific departments. So the air pollution people are gonna target uh, have a, reaching the, the, uh, the air pollution standards, people who are in, in charge of traffic. Okay. Gonna, Thank, just... Thanks, Audrey. Thank you very much. And, and that's a good point about the co-production because actually, you know, it's a pu we need public pressure on this. And we've seen that very much from our young people around climate change and uh, that we need to we need to really tap into that and show the heart. Okay, Audrey, thank you very much. Um, right, we're moving on to Maria Jose Rocco, uh, who is uh, who's, um, an architect from the Polis Network in Brussels. So um, tell, tell us about the Polis Network. Uh, oh, we've still got Audrey here. Audrey, tell us about the Polis Network. Hello. Uh, Maria Am Jose, Maria Am Jose, welcome okay. to you I and a good evening okay. to you. Tell us a little bit about the network and, um, and, and what it does. Okay, good evening everyone. So well, the, the Polis Network is a network of cities and regions, European cities and regions, working together towards transport innovation and transport sustainability. So we are over 90 members already. And we, well, we do different things. On the one hand, we represent the voice of cities and regions towards the European institutions, but we participate in a, a high number of European projects related to urban mobility and on different aspects. And we also work um, on peer-to-peer -peer exchange, so facilitating knowledge transfer be between cities. And we have different pillars. We look at traffic efficiency, at the environment and health, at governance, at access, etc. And under these, each of these pillars, we have several working groups. And there is the place where cities gather and they can exchange knowledge, they can share best practices and learn from, from each other on, on topics that are important mm -hmm. uh, for, for so, them. So, Marie Jose, so, uh, you know, when I, I, I used to travel around Euro European cities in the old days before the pandemic, and you do notice a fair bit of difference between active transport, say, for example, in Copenhagen or Amsterdam and uh, my own city of Bradford or Glasgow. Where we're having COP26. Well, how, how do you how do you spread good practice? Do you see that in your network? Yes, of course we have uh, front runners in, in active travel. That's really high, uh, very good mothership of active travel, and this is for a number of reasons. It has to do with, of course, infrastructure. Firstly, having safe infrastructure is very important to convince people to, to, to take the bicycle in, in this case, for example. So infrastructure is key, but there are other aspects related to behavior change and how can uh, people uh, decide to, to take this mode of transport. And it has to be, it has to, is related as well to, to policies that can help this happen. So it really needs political commitment. It needs uh, also monitoring of the different measures that are in place to show how they are um, successful. It needs communication as well. It's very important how to communicate the benefits that you can bring for the city and for the citizens. So, so there is a, a wide array of things that cities can do. And it's true that different cities are on different levels in this regard. OK, thank you. So, so uh, I think let's talk about the pandemic because it has changed cities, hasn't it, remarkably. I, I remember in the first week of lockdown in March last year, cycling into the hospital, which I do every day, and uh, the roads were empty, no air pollution, no traffic to run me over. It was the most wonderful commute I've ever had. But things have changed, obviously, since then. 
T tell us about how COVID-19 has, has changed our behaviors, changed our cities. So, well, of course, as you mentioned, we saw a, a dramatic uh, decrease in, in traffic levels, 70, 80, or even 90% in many cities and how, uh, of course, um, during the lockdown, of course, the, the pollution levels dropped, also uh, traffic related accidents dropped, not at the same rate. And we see also, we saw also that uh, public transport was very hit very hard, um, and it still uh, has not is recovering slowly, but not yet uh, has reached the, the pre-pandemic levels. But one of the positive things, as you mentioned, was uh, the the rise in active travel. How people had this chance to experience the city with uh, more space, without pollution, and how these had the potential as well. Uh, even though uh, travel habits are very difficult to change, to to um, make this uh, beha change behavior. So uh, we've seen, this is one of the most uh, positive. We've also seen how, how cities have been deploying infrastructure for, for cycling, giving more space to people, reallocating sp uh, space for pedestrians and cyclists. This was a kind of revelation uh, for many people of how unbalanced the distribution of space is in cities. And something uh, worth mentioning is that cities that already had uh, their sustainable mobility plans in place would fast track them and were more successful in, in implementing this kind of uh, sustainable mobility measures. Also, it was a time for, for experimentation as well. Uh, measures could be put in place, but they could also be trial uh, and adapted if necessary. So it was a really very interesting period and we, can, we have to learn a lot about it. And, and that legacy, how sustainable do you think it is? Winter's coming, everybody stopped cycling, I've noticed. Um, you know, are we going to, and everybody's back in the cars rather than public transport because they're scared of catching COVID. Are, are, is, it, is it a sustainable legacy, those positive benefits? Well, so, so our, our um, mobility systems are not sustainable. And that's true, what we are seeing that when, once the, the, the restrictions were lifted, we have again uh, a high, high number of um, the private vehicle ridership. And uh, we can see this is because we really need to, to change, to have a systemic change in our uh, mobility systems. On the other, other hand, it's true that many cities uh, uh, that implemented this kind of measures, we, according to the ECF, uh, around 2,000 kilometers were announced, of which uh, 1,500 were actually implemented. This encouraged many cities to, to actually fast track their plans, and we've seen how cities like, like, like uh, Ber Berlin, like Brussels, Milan, Rome, Barcelona may have really advanced a lot in recycling agendas, have actually um, well expanded as well the cycling network, not only network, but the cycling network, but also uh, closing streets uh, to, to traffic, um, uh, implementing other urban vehicle access regulations, uh, slowing uh, or limiting the, the traffic, uh, the speed traffic limits. So uh, we've seen this uh, all over in many cities in, in Europe. So there's for sure a legacy. And I think the most important legacy is also what we have learned, that it's important that cities can, can share knowledge in times of, of uh, crisis, like the ones we've experienced, but we may also experience more in the future. In the, the importance of public transport that kept things moving throughout the, the pandemic and that we have to, to make sure that uh, uh, public tra transport continues to be the, the backbone of, of, of urban mobility and the importance of having diverse mobility ecosystems because these are more resilient so these are some of the, the fantastic lessons learned. <laughs> fantastic thank thank you very much maria jose i think that's a very optimistic uh, note to uh, pass on to uh, matthew uh, we're going to keep uh, get matthew baldwin in the uh Hello. If we can. matthew can you see uh, me? so matthew is the deputy director general for the uh, european commission's transport and mobility uh, and he's in the room I'm there. I'm here. So good. Good to and see you. And what you lot online can't see is a lovely audience who are sitting oh, patiently love, here watching you. I'd like to suggest, because it's getting late here, that we have the audience come up and give you all a wave online, because you probably can't see them, can you? Well, let's let's talk to you first, and then we'll do that okay, again. Okay, we'll have yeah. a stage I'm all, invasion, I'm all for but, a bit of audience participation, yeah. me. But no, no um, spectator injuries, hopefully. Um, so, so, Matthew, you're a policymaker, so let's let's... I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but tell me, you're, you're leading this 100 Climate Neutral Cities project uh, for yes. the EU. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's, um, I'm an old bureaucrat, John, and, uh, and it's the most exciting thing I've done in my 30 years of, 
of bureaucracy. <laughs> it's, and I've got my mask stuck in my earpiece now, so it's going to be a very distinguished look. Um, it is it is an extraordinary project, and it, and uh, let me first say I, how much I I'm struggling for things to say because I agree with every single thing that the panelists have already said. Um, really inspirationally good stuff, and thank you all very very much. What we are going to try to do with the 100 Climate Neutral Cities project is essentially bring all that to life. We've got to. I mean, all these words flying around the center here, talking about levels of ambition and commitments and pledges, we've actually got to start doing it. The European Green Deal will not come to life spontaneously on its own. It's got to be implemented. Uh, we are the micro to the carbon pricing um, uh, uh, policies, which will be essential within the EU to drive, uh, uh, drive the, uh, the opposition to climate change. So what we will do later this month is release a call for expression of interest to the cities of the European Union. We are looking for cities of more than 50,000 people to come forward. And so, the, so, so, Matty, how yeah. many cities are there in Europe? How many cities over 50,000 people? Oh, that's a very awkward question. I don't okay, know. Sorry, the top sorry, of I mean, I go think on, there are about a thousand cities of more than 100,000. So it's, okay. a, it's a big well, pool of cities. Yeah. And sorry, just to finish the point, we want the mayor to express his or her strong ambition to go climate neutral by 2030. That's a very exacting, exacting task. We will then choose 100 cities. We have a wonderful consortium made up of 35 leading um, uh, uh, climate organizations, such as the EIT Climate Kick, such as ECLAY, such as Eurocities, and we'll work with the cities. We'll try to channel the finance to them. They will try to produce what we're calling climate city contracts and related investment plans. And we then need to bring the big bucks, and it is big bucks, about a billion euros for an average city of 100,000 to go climate neutral, bring those big bucks to bear to bring the concrete changes into place that we need, whether it's in mobility, whether it's in energy efficiency, whether it's in energy generation or the circular economy. So there's no pressure, but that's what we're up to. Rather than concrete, I hope, Matthew. So, <laughs> so, um, so tell me, so the, the, my worry when you say that, it sounds fantastic actually, but. My worry is that it'll be a it, the level playing field won't be there in terms of we'll have big industrial European cities that are just going to find it too difficult to become climate neutral, and those who are smaller and sort of touristy places, you know, who have light industry or tech industry, who who are going to find it easier. How are you going to mm -hmm. make sure that that's fair across those thousand cities? Well, you'd be surprised that the cities that are talking privately to me about their interests. It's not just the usual suspects, the Copenhagen's, you know, the Finnish cities. Um, we've got some very interesting cities are coming forward. Uh, yes, it's more challenging doing it the larger the city. You have issues of organizational complexity. And, and by the way, we're coming out of the EU's Horizon Europe project. It is about innovation, innovations of governance, innovations of organizations. And if you like, um, the, the bigger cities have got the capabilities and the capacities, the, a lot of the knowledge. Some of the smaller cities struggle because you don't have the, 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 the levels of expertise to really capture and uh, come up with the policies to to drive down your 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 climate uh, your greenhouse gas emissions, so we want a mission that looks like the European Union, as Bill Clinton once said of his cabinet. So we want cities from each member state, and I'm determined to do that. I've spoken today to the mayors of Prague, of Budapest, of Marseille, um, uh, and and all of these cities in their different ways have strong interests, and I very much hope they're going to come on board. I hope you can hear the bagpipes in the background, by the way. We've not no, got no, we can't, but, no, but I'm, I'm just sorry. wondering whether if we if we could reverse Brexit, can we um, can we get a shout as well, Matthew? Well, legally speaking, we will enable uh, all cities to participate um, from countries that have done association agreements with Horizon Europe, and I understand that a number of those association negotiations are still ongoing. Uh, I believe that's still the case for the UK, but that's the position. Um, we're, we're, yeah. Once so, you're associated with that. Horizon Europe, uh, you can join Horizon Europe programmes. Good. So, so, so that that sounds really exciting, Matthew. Thank you. T tell me a little bit about uh, in in your in your you, you're you're a, you're a, not an old bureaucrat. A, I a, really am, John. A, a young, you can't see a young me close <laughs> bureaucrat. Tell tell us about the the challenges of policy change when it comes to. Um, climate and carbon emissions and transport it, 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 do you find in your career is the time right for these changes now I mean presumably 20 years ago nobody was listening do you, have you seen that change in, over time yes 
I mean, it is extraordinary the period we're living in. Um, we have had the ambition to be a climate neutral continent by 2050 for some time, and we've been uh, talking about what emission uh, reductions to go for. And frankly speaking, I thought the COVID epidemic would knock us off course. But President Ursula von der Leyen uh, in September 2020 in her State of the Union speech did not back off. She had every opportunity to say, well, look, it's really tough right now with the economies. We have to, we have to, we have to step back. She didn't. She said, we're going ahead with the 55% reduction because we can do it. We've done these studies. That is a viable thing for us to deliver. And that's what we're now pursuing with what we're calling the Fit for 55 package, an unprecedentedly wide set of legislative measures, which is now on the table of the council and the parliament as we, as we bring these things forward. And so I have every confidence in the European Union, sorry, backed by a binding EU climate law, which has every member state committed already up front to that 55% reduction. It's a question of how we do it, not whether we do it. I see skepticism in the audience, but uh, trust me. Um, but just in that context, John, can I pick up a point that Audrey made mm. about behavior change? And it is absolutely imperative that we, at different levels of the EU, whether it's at the European level or the national level or the local level, get the systemic offer right. The guy that drives his car from Antwerp into Brussels every day, and it is usually a guy, and it is usually a, on his own, and it's a white guy in his car, isn't a bad guy. It is that we have collectively offered him a system which gives him uh, a great uh, reduction in terms of taxation from having a company car. We have generally poor public transport, and I'm not singling Belgium out, but that's generally the case, and then free parking when he gets to the city, and no road tolls. So the system that we offer people will drive the behavior change that we know is necessary. And that's what we need to do, not just in terms of our European policy change, and believe you me, that is coming, but we also have to drive it at every level. And again, back to my project, you can build that bottom up with a city. What are the city's needs? Are there problems in getting to climate neutrality involving mobility? We can address that. Are there problems involved in the refurbishment of buildings? Uh, we really, uh, uh, we, I, I think we're onto a winner here because we have a project which we can assemble like a Lego kit, which is a great favorite here in Glasgow, to deliver these things in practice. Okay, Matthew, that's fantastic. Thanks very much. Right, we've had given everybody their sort of seven, eight minutes to uh, contribute. I'm going to take a couple of Q and A's from the um, panel to the panel, if that's okay. And then I'm going to give everybody a quick a fairy godmother wish of what you would like to see, a single thing that would you'd like to see in the next 10 years. So let's just start off with the uh, Q&As. Um, so uh, uh, there's been a huge shift in people moving out of cities, very true. Um, what will a city of 2040, I'm gonna bring that back to everybody at the end actually, if that's okay. Uh, Mark Sansom, uh, 50 years, research and scientific community have performed a tremendous job. But at a practice level, good examples are rare. Indeed, they are. Um, let's let's go to Matthew. Actually, since you're you're still on there, Matthew, how, how do we um, engage practice better and bring public health and planning closer to deliver radical transformation? Well, back to the points that. Um, my colleagues on this panel were making so well earlier on um, about how we can bring the health benefits into this equation, how we can make climate neutral cities also healthy cities. We underestimate, as underestimate enormously how much health uh, matters. Um, uh, Mark talked about air pollution and noise. Noise is the forgotten thing. Air pollution kills 500,000 people a year in the European Union. Um, you know, the road safety aspects are forgotten. That costs us between 200 and 300 billion euros a year in terms of external costs. And last but not least, um, if we are smart about it, we don't just address the external costs, we address the external benefits that we can bring. Let me give you an example of that. If we- Briefly, Matthew. Yeah, sorry, very briefly. If we just look at the mobility aspects of what we get from bike lanes, we will chronically underinvest it underinvest in bike lanes. If we look at the broader health aspects, we will do much more. And the really exciting thing for me is right here in Scotland, the health authority is now investing in bike lanes because they can see the overall benefits of the, that, that will bring to the population. So think broadly about health and that will also set us on the right uh, path. Good, thank you very much, nice answer. Um, right, we've got another question about um, not to reduce negative externalities around the globe. What about green, sustainable public procurement? We don't hear enough about that. Gara, 
That sounds like your neck of the woods. Have you got an answer for that? Um, let's see here, the negative externalities, um, the negative externalities. I don't I'm quite sure if I understand the question. Is it the negative externalities that- oh, no, I think it's more about public procurement of green sustainable, of how, how, how we stop buying stuff that's bad for the world. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on then. Gara, don't, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Mark, <laughs> let's go back to our glamorous leader, Mark. How, how about you? What about public, what about green public procurement? Um, I think it's always very important, but what I would like to mention actually is there's some really nice initiatives that's coming back to the question of Mark Sampson. I think where we see uh, changes in our cities, I mean, if I look at my city of Barcelona, for example, we're introducing new urban models like the super blocks. Uh, these super blocks, I mean, slowly but steadily, they've been introduced uh, to reduce the air pollution, reduce noise, um, introduce more green space and make people more active. So I think there are things happening. Another one that I see here in, in Barcelona is the uh, Plaza Glorias, what was before a big roundabout uh, for cars getting into the city. They tore it down, they made a tunnel, and now we've got a nice park on top of it. Um, furthermore, we increasing the cycling lanes in 2015, 120 kilometers of cycling lanes. This goes up to 273 uh, kilometers of cycling lanes in 2023. So I see some of these practices that we've been saying these are good actually being introduced, I think. And that's for me quite encouraging. I mean, other okay. things what I see is the 15 minute city in Paris, the car free neighborhood in Vauban and Freiburg. I think these are great examples that we should follow. Okay, thanks, Mark. So, uh, uh, and, but for all these good examples, we do have the duplicity of our political leaders. For example, Martina talks about um, how a new business from Ohio is planning a pipeline on the water to Scotland for, um, for gas, is that right? For fracking. Oh, that would be very disappointing. Anyway, I'm not sure if we can answer that question, but um, but uh, yeah, yeah, be careful who you listen, who you believe. I think, or be careful <laughs> about the politicians, anyway, because uh, we're busy doing more um, drilling more oil in the North Sea while we're doing COP26. Okay, we've got five minutes left, and what I'd like to go back is to um, okay, Martino, you've got the report. Thank you very much. Send us put that in the in the Q and A if you can a link, and we'll have a look at that and be. Um, get our anger up um so so let's let's we've got five minutes left i'd like to just get um let's end up on a positive note as as we as cop 26 heads towards an end and i'm going to be the fairy godmother and i'm going to give all our panelists one wish of what they would like to see in 10 years time okay so well, let's start with mark mark one thing for cities that you'd like to see tear up the asphalt and plant more trees and uh, provide more uh, space for people to be active. Good, that's a nice one. Okay, uh, Christian, if we can switch quickly enough to you, we'll get you back in the picture. Yeah, so one wish, I think it would be rather than to our sort of to COP and our, our leaders really is rather than saying it's business as usual and technology will save the day, I think our leaders really need to be upfront with people on what each of us needs to do, can do, and provide the right investment and infrastructure to enable us to do it. So I think um, this can be done fairly quickly. It just oh, I like the idea up, of but, truth. Yeah. I like that idea of truth <laughs> in our leaders. That's, that's a good wish. Yeah, truth. I mean, yeah. investment goes in the wrong, wrong direction at the moment. I think yeah. it needs to go. I mean, in the UK, we have a road building program and uh, the US now with the infrastructure program in, is investing billions and billions into new roads and airports. That's just the yeah. right way to do it. So if can change that that would be my yeah. biggest wish honest politicians let let that's <laughs> gonna i think you've already won my vote right uh gara what about you let's get you on the screen mm -hmm. so we can see you. um yes hi great thanks um well i think mine might be even a little bit more ambitious i would really love to see uh, a shift in, in paradigm in the way we think so that food is not an afterthought of last thing i just throw in the in the microwave but we're really aware of, um, of the need for producing our own food and it becomes an integral part of our life, just as important as our job, as important as uh, being with our family is producing our own food. 
and uh, doing it in a sustainable in a sustainable way. So I would like to see a lot more food production in cities. Sustainable urban food production. That's a great thing. I'm going to put. I'm going to follow that up with you, Gara. I'd really like to hear more about that. But that's a that's a great wish. Um, okay, Audrey. I, I so many things, but maybe the yeah. The, I know that's the hard thing. That's that's why this is hard. One <laughs> wish. Okay, one wish would be to see each every uh, parking lot and parked car to be replaced by a tree or a bench or a slide or a football goal. Rip up the parking lots. They <laughs> paid paradise. Yeah, that's a great. That is great. I love it. Get rid of car parking. That would that would stop the problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, uh, Maria Jose, over to you. Let's put you on the screen. Yes, hello. Well, I would like to to ask to have again a, a walking world. So, uh, where in, within cities you can walk to the the places you need to go daily, uh, where it's safe, it's convenient, it's comfortable to to walk around and also to use the bike uh, without having having to to having the the sufficient space to to do so. That's great. Pedestrianized cities, a whole city pedestrianized without any car parking. I'm, I'm just, I only come and live where you guys are living. Okay, Matthew, finally, one wish from you. Well, thank you, Fairy Godmother. Um, I want all of the other wishes, plus I want you to <laughs> fulfill my prediction, which is that in 10 years' time, we will have shown that cities can be climate neutral that it is deliverable and that the money will flow to, to, to fund those things, realizing all the beautiful benefits that my co-panelists have just uh, uh, described, because those things do come together. If we can address the climate neutrality, we'll get the better air quality and all the rest of it. And that this model is then being adopted and rolled out across the European Union and across the world. Thank you. Uh, spoken as a true policymaker. Matthew, thank you very much. And thank you to all our panelists.